So today we're at CERN with Professor Mario Campanelli here. So oh. who are you <laughs> and what's your career journey? <laughs> All right. Well, I, uh, I'm a particle physicist, as you can imagine from the location. <laughs> and I've been working uh, on experiments in particle physics for about 25 years. So I uh, started off in, in, in Rome University. I'm, I'm from Rome originally. And uh, so I um, did my master thesis on um, uh, building a calorimeter for the L3 experiment. It was located right over there in Saint Genis, about uh, three kilometers from here. And that experiment was one uh, of the detectors um, uh, around the collision points of lab. So before the LHC, here at CERN, we had another accelerator. It was still same size, 27 kilometers. And this accelerator was colliding electrons and anti-electrons instead of protons like the LHC. And also around the four collision points of the accelerator, there were four large uh, detectors. They were called uh, L3, uh, Ale, Foban and Delphi. So I was working on the L3 experiment already with my master thesis. So I was also a summer student here at CERN in 1994, which is a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, at the time I met with other people from the other groups, other universities, and then they offered me a PhD uh, to stay here, uh, working for ATH Zurich. So I started very shortly after graduation, graduating from the, the, the master, I started my PhD here, uh, and then I had to go occasionally to Zurich, but uh, I was based here already from, say, 95 to 98. There was, uh, I was working on analyzing the data from L3s. We were working on uh, measuring the properties of W bosons. So the W bosons were produced in large quantities uh, at uh, uh, lab two, uh, and that was the topic of my of my PhD thesis. Then after that, uh, there was a new neutrino group that started in uh, uh, in uh, ETH with uh, Professor Andre Rubia, who is, by the way, the, the son of a famous Nobel Prize winner. And then, uh, uh, and then I got to know him, and then uh, I talked to him, and then somehow uh, we liked each other, and he offered me a postdoc position. So I started working for with him on uh, Icarus. There was a liquid argon neutron experiment. Uh, it was a precursor of what is now Dune. Now we have, there is a, this enormous project, Dune, that will hopefully be built in the United States in a few years' time. And so Icarus was actually the first large detector that was using the liquid argon technology. So I worked there between 1998 and 2001. Uh, but then I sort of realized that, well, I wanted to stay here in the in area, and at the turn there was not going to be a lot of neutrino physics uh, in that period. Now there is a neutrino group here at CERN, but uh, there wasn't at the time. And of course there was a time when uh, the uh, lab stopped working, lab uh, finished its operation in the year 2000, and it restarted, and um, uh, it was supposed to restart in 2000. Uh, and six, two thousand seven, then in the end it started just on eight, two thousand nine. But uh, so there was not much to do apart from building uh, detectors, and I sort of didn't like very much building detectors. Uh, uh, it was more on the analysis side. So I, I said, and that was quite a good move. I said, uh, uh, well, the, 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 I would like to do some analysis on a hadron collider, and the hadron collider at the time was uh, um, the Tevatron uh, close to Chicago. The, uh, and then there was a position at Geneva University. So I decided that since, again, I didn't want to move uh, too much, uh, so I, I applied for that position at Geneva University. I got it uh, for six years. Uh, so uh, during this time, I was sort of based here, but I was spending about one month out of three in, in Chicago. Well, Fermi Lab, uh, close to Chicago. So I worked on this, that experiment, uh, on the CDF experiment. Uh, and then after that, I got the, well, I started to get to be a bit old, and I needed a really permanent job, and so I, I got uh, the UCL job to work on Atlas. And as I said, I mean, I think that the, the, having already six years of experience on a hadron collider, uh, so there at, at, at CDF was uh, was a good move because I think the UCL people like that. Mm. Uh, and then after that, well, I've been uh, working uh, for for UCL ever since. Uh, mainly on Atlas, but I'm still working also on other experiments. I'm participating in Clodium, this, this neutrino uh, liquid argon detector, and then we're trying to, to find some experiments at CERN, uh, as smaller scale experiments at CERN, that could, uh, uh, you know, bring some spice to what the lab is doing, uh, uh, 
towards the end of the LHC, but also to perhaps at a, you know during the big gap that will be after the end of the LHC. So you've mentioned you now work at Atlas. So what is it exactly? Well, Atlas uh, is actually located. Over there, well, it's 100 meters underground, but uh, you can see the building was paint, it's painted with large colors mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, this, this represents is a drawing of the Atlas detector. So Atlas is uh, really the closest detector uh, you can think of with respect to the main cell site. So it's a, it's a large particle detector. It's actually the largest collider detector ever built. It's like 43 meters long and 25 meters high. It's a cylinder with a horizontal axis. Uh, the idea is that we have protons colliding at uh, an enormous rate, we have about 40 million collisions per second, and then the protons collide and produce uh, heavy particles, and these heavy particles uh, decay, and we cannot see them directly, we only can see uh, the decay products. So I uh, like to say as, as a joke that what we're doing is if, like if you're saying throwing two apples at high speed one against each other in the collision you produce a watermelon but that explodes immediately you can't see it. The only thing you can see and measure are the directions and the velocities of the little black seeds coming from the explosion of the watermelon and starting from that measuring that you should uh, reconstruct the watermelon that the shape of the watermelon. Not exactly what they're doing, but almost we're colliding ordinary particles like protons to produce heavy states. These heavy states decay. These are the particles we're interested in. Um, then we um, deduce, they, we infer the properties of these heavy states from what you observe in the atlas detector. So we have to reconstruct what was uh, produced. And why that? Well, that's because we're interested in these heavy particles because these are um, particles that we are. Um, filled in the primordial universe a few moments after the Big Bang. So that's exactly uh, why, in a way, we're doing this kind of physics, because we want to understand the basic uh, laws of physics, we want to understand the early structure of the universe. And in order to do that, we have to recreate similar conditions in a controlled environment, and that's what we're doing, uh, smashing protons at very high energies. So, of course, this generates a lot of data. Um, how's that oh, analyzed? Yes. That's about 100 petabytes per year. An enormous amount of data. If you want uh, to write them in DVDs, it's about 20 kilometers of DVD every year. You know, pile of 20. Of course, we are not using DVDs; we are using tapes. But still, there's a lot of tapes. So um, data is uh, collected, of course, by the detector. First of all, we are not writing out everything that's produced by the accelerator. That will be an even more. Uh, it will be absolutely uh, unbearable, technically speaking. So what we are doing is that we make a um, selection, a very stark selection, ready at the level of data taking. We uh, have the system that's called the trigger system. The trigger system um, selects 1,000 collisions per uh, second out of 40 million. So it's a tiny minority of the uh, collisions that are actually uh, measured and are actually stored. Um, but we do measure actually, we do measure all the collisions. Simply, this, um, the online system selects what we think are the most interesting collisions. And that's, that's the first selection happens there. And then we have another, um, the most uh, important thing is, of course, the offline analysis that can take years. The offline analysis means that we are writing software that, first of all, reconstructs uh, the, uh, the events. And then we are uh, making measurements. So starting from what we see in the detector, we compare that with the theory and we infer the properties of the particles that are produced in the collisions. Mm -hmm. And obviously you work for Atlas at UCL. So how does the university in London contribute to what happens at CERN? And how's your time split between the two? Well, I'm a bit of a special case because mm -hmm. I spent mo more time here than in London. While for my uh, senior colleagues, this is the, uh, the opposite. So my senior colleagues, live in London and they, 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 they camp here occasionally, I mainly live here and go to London for teaching. Uh, on the other hand, uh, um, we have like PhD students uh, who spend uh, uh, long periods here at CERN. We have postdocs, some of them are full-time here. We have staff members, uh, uh, say technical staff members, who spend years and years here at CERN. So uh, really, we, we, we try a lot. Anyway, I must say that nowadays, um, being physically present somewhere is not that relevant anymore because uh, I remember when I uh, started like as a master of PhD student um, we had in order to give a presentation to a meeting you had this the slides handwritten <laughs> slides or maybe you had to 
photocopy so you have to show a plot you have to print it with the printer then photocopy it on a slide and then write uh, by hand with nice colors <laughs> and uh, so you had to be physically present in the room to give a presentation nowadays of course we have video conferences uh, all the time I mean, way before the covid we've been doing video conferences for 20 years so, so uh, being physically present in the lab of course it's good because you talk to the people you and of course it's very important if you have hardware um, commitments. I mean, if you have to work on a piece of the detector, well, you have to go there uh, from time to time. But on the other hand, if you're just doing analysis, uh, and that's what most of the people are doing, it's not so fundamental to, uh, to be physically here. So it's definitely possible to uh, contribute to the atlas analysis from anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, there are people who never come to serve. On the other hand, well, I do have some hardware responsibilities on a piece of our atlas. I work on the trigger system, the trigger that the system selects events and also for that it's much better to be here uh, and also the environment uh, here, I mean you really talk to the people. But as I said in the end uh, during this, this period of uh, uh, say remote working uh, it was not a big change for most of us. And you, you're teaching classical mechanics in first year so how does that relate to what you're doing? Now? Ah, <laughs> well uh, well, classical mechanics uh, is the base of everything, right? So, in a way, uh, classical mechanics, first of all, it's important because you need to learn a method, a method how to solve problems, how to do research, uh, and then how to uh, find yourself with something that you've never seen before and uh, well, find a solution. So, that, that's clearly the method is very important. Uh, the, uh, I mean, here we are using relativistic mechanics, right, to understand our collision. So, is a slight step forward, but it's not so so different. Uh, and of course, yeah, I mean, basic concepts like uh, uh, vectors, uh, angles, uh, energy, momentum, and so on are always there. And the course is reputed for being um, slightly difficult. Uh, any advice for oh first-year <laughs> students uh, <laughs> yes. starting this year, and especially starting remotely as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my advice is to. Try to do as many problems as possible, mm. as many, yeah. you know, read, even read them, and uh, that's what I always say, you, you don't have to spend hours and hours trying to solve something, but uh, read a problem, if you don't manage to solve it, read the solution, don't be ashamed of that, of course not for every problem, but uh, you know, in the end, there are only so many classes of problems you can have, right, and then once you've seen them a lot, then, then you're got to practice on them and then you should be able to solve it mm. easier. And now coming back to CERN, um, yes. why pursue such an experiment that consumes so much electricity and requires so ah. many resources? <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, first of all, yeah, it is true <coughs> that experiments consume energy. It's about uh, half of the houses of uh, the, mm. the city of Geneva, what the CERN consumes when the, the LHC is fully operational. So, yes. Uh, on the other hand, this is a, a, a worldwide uh, sort of lab, and there are, we don't have ten uh, labs like CERN in the world. There's only one. So if you consider the resource, and then you also think about how much it costs. Yes, I mean, the, the, the cost of the LHC was about five uh, billion Swiss francs. Uh, but uh, again, if you sum all the cost of all the little, small experiments in, say, solid state physics, done in thousands of labs all over the world then um, solid state physics is more expensive than particle physics. Mm. And uh, the, the budget of CERN is roughly like, like budget of a, a big university. I don't know exactly compared to UCL, but uh, uh, it's roughly comparable to ETH Zurich. Uh, and it should be roughly the same yes. as UCL. So in the end, you know, it is, a, a, it is a big budget. I mean, I'm not saying it's small, but it should be seen in perspective. It's the budget of a big university, so it's much uh, smaller than any you know, large, if you want to build an, a motorway, that would cost definitely more than the LHC. So, you know, a tunnel like the Gotthard tunnel, they cost far more than the LHC. Mm. So, uh, anyway, it's, the resources are a lot, but it's not unbearable, it's not crazy. Um, now, from the point of view of practical applications, of course, uh, um, well, first of all, you should uh, consider looking back in history that there are some enormous revolutions in technology that came from basic research, just like thinking about the, 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 the Maxwell unification of electricity and magnetism gave us electromagnetic waves, radio, television, things that were completely inconceivable before that. 
quantum mechanics, if you think about it, uh, is the basis of all modern electronics, computer transistors, and so on. So uh, we don't know exactly what will be the benefits of research in particle physics we are doing today, but also uh, we know that there are a lot of technological benefits coming from the fact that at CERN we are not only doing uh, uh, basic research, but also doing a lot of applied research because we are uh, we want to develop the technologies for the accelerators of tomorrow, for the detectors of tomorrow. So there are a lot of people working on pushing frontiers what is possible in terms of uh, um, in terms of vacuum technologies for the accelerator in, in, in terms of uh, superconductivity again for the accelerators, uh, very fast electronics, uh, of course uh, computing. Uh, even you know solar panels they developed using some ultra vacuum techniques um, medical physics because you can bombard a human body like it was a, a target and then you put a detector behind and you do uh, diagnostics like for the PET the positron emission tomography you can cure cancers and you know the next to UCL they're building this hadron therapy center and then the hadron therapy was enormously developed here at CERN there is a hadron therapy group since many years and I love the technology that now really using hospitals that come from this research. So, of course, we are not doing the LHT because we want to cure cancer. This is not the point, right? But the point is that we are pushing knowledge and then some, something comes out. Mm. Right. And, of course, the internet was um, partly invented here. Well, the web. Yeah. So, actually, the internet also, in some sense that, uh, the internet comes from this ARPANET, right, which is one of a very old uh, project from the uh, American Ministry of Defense. Uh, however, uh, the, at some point, every uh, computer, first of all, there were few tens of computers in the world, they were all enormous supercomputers, every manufacturer had its own network. So if you had a, a Cray computer, you could talk to another Cray computer, but not to, you know, a, a, a digi digital computer or whatever. So um, the internet uh, started, also with the name internet, started uh, um, developing some protocols, so this famous TCPAP protocol, and certain people contributed to the TCPAP protocol. So that was before the web. Yeah. And of course, there was the dimension of the web that was completely something done by CERN. And again, because there was the same problem as today, most of the people who uh, are uh, working on experiments at CERN they were not, and they are not, physically located here in Geneva, right? So uh, there was a need of a tool to communicate between scientists working on the same experiment uh, from universities all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the universities already had the internet, but they were not really using it very, very much because the internet was empty. Mm -hmm. It was just used as a tool to copy a file from here to there, but there was no public information. Uh, and so the, the web was a great idea because they say, okay, let's fill the internet up with free public information, first for scientific purposes and then, well, everything that follows it. Mm. And now we've seen a lot of technologies and knowledge that has come out of CERN. What, what benefits could a uh, larger um, collider bring? There's a plan 100 kilometers long. Yeah, I know there is this plan. So, um, if I, <laughs> I should say, I'm, uh, I'm not completely convinced of this project. Uh, that means, of course, it's a, it's a great project in the sense that that will be the logical next step, and also the idea that first one should do um, electron positron collider, and then a hadron collider. Why electron positron collider? Because uh, uh, there are uh, well, the standard model is basically complete, but uh, the the Higgs boson has been produced in large quantities. We don't know the properties of the Higgs boson in great detail because uh, the LHC can only produce a given amount and then it's a very uh, complex environment. Uh, so, it, it was, for instance, it's impossible to study the coupling of the Higgs boson to electrons or muons because the background is way too large. Uh, it will be hard to study the coupling of, its, of the Higgs boson with itself. So, uh, building an um, electron-anti-electron -electron collider could really uh, bring us closer to, I mean, improve a lot the precision on what we know in the Higgs boson. And also we can measure the mass of the top quark with very large precision. So there's always been this idea that after the LHC, there should be an uh, uh, electron positron collider. Uh, so that could be circular, it could be, it could be linear. For a long time, people thought that, well, the next uh, step is a linear A plus E minus collider. Now there is this idea at CERN, and so at CERN there was this project called CLIC. CLIC will be a 30 kilometer linear 
collider that will be go around the Jura Mountains, like that, on the foothills of the Jura Mountains. Uh, now there is again the idea of having a circular collider, uh, because then you can have electrons first and then protons uh, later. Um, so, as I said, I mean, I'm, that would be obvious from the scientific point of view, yes, to study the properties uh, of the Higgs in great detail and then go to the highest possible energies to, to, to see what is out there. Uh, what I'm not fully really convinced of is that this is uh, educationally uh, and from the point of view of intellectual curiosity the right path. Because if I'm, it really sound, looks like uh, a brute force approach and uh, if you're telling a bright student uh, uh, well, you know, in 20 years time, there will be, or maybe 30 years time, there will be an enormous collider that is basically the repetition of what it is that I see, but just larger, uh, the person will not be uh, drawn to that. We won't be enthusiastic because uh, the, the, the intellectual curiosity is stimulated by something completely new. So I, I really, I don't know, that's my personal opinion, so I could totally assume that, but uh, I, I would like to say, okay, there won't be a next generation LHC, so go back to the drawing board and think about what can be done with a different technique, with different technology. People are doing that, there are a lot of projects, but that's true that uh, if you really want to go to the energy frontier, it's very hard to think, think about something else. Because so, there is also the idea that uh, by having this larger collider we could go at higher speeds and therefore we could um, know something about supersymmetry, for example. Um, do you think that's the case? Yeah, well, the other, uh, that's always been the case about supersymmetry or, say, theories for uh, what is beyond what you know already, what beyond the standard model. Mm. That's been already the case for the LHC, if you want. Uh, I would say that 90% of the people uh, told that uh, we would have discovered uh, supersymmetry in the LHC. Mm. Now, it's not, the, the, the story is not over, right? I mean, there is LHC will still run for many years. Uh, but clearly, the easy sort of uh, physics beyond the standard model uh, is not around the corner, right? We, we, people, a lot of people are expecting some big discoveries to happen uh, one year, two years after the, the start of the machine, and it, this didn't happen. Uh, so, yeah, of course, the idea is to, to go to high energies to discover something beyond the standard model. That, that's the point of having this machine. However, uh, well, the question is if there is nothing. And that, that will be really, oof, that will be really strange. Of course, if you don't build a machine, you will never know. So, but we don't have, at the moment, that's the problem, that the, uh, at the moment we don't have clear indications that there is some new physics around the corner. However, things can change, and of course everybody hopes that this will change uh, after uh, the, uh, the run tree, after the high luminosity of the LHC and so on. We, we have collected only a small, very small fraction of the data we want to collect with the LHC. So we hope that with more data we'll have either a discovery, of course that will be the best, or an, a hint that there must be new physics at higher energies. In that case, uh, building a higher energy machine will be fully justified. Mm. So now moving a bit on to physics and coming back to you, what do you do outside um, of science? Any oh, other activities? Yeah, uh, yeah I do practice? a lot of things. Uh, because, uh, also, you know, I enjoy uh, the, the, this region because uh, it is a nice place with, where there is an international city, uh, but at the same time there is a you know, countryside, there is a lake, there are mountains and things like this. Uh, also enjoying being in London because London is, is the opposite. You don't have <laughs> mountains, you don't have lakes, uh, well, small ones, uh, <laughs> but um, on the other hand it's a vibrant city with a lot of uh, cultural life and cultural activity. So, I mean, I do uh, definitely go to go out uh, quite a lot, uh, both in Geneva and, and in London. I listen to a lot of music, uh, uh, classical jazz uh, mainly. I do play badly, but I try my best, uh, both in a small orchestra here and, you know, with small groups. I do sailing during the summer on the lake here. Um, also in a small lake in London, I found a small place where you could sail. And, uh, well, I uh, hike, I do ski, cross country, downhill, uh, ski touring during the winter. Yeah, this kind, this kind of things. Really. And so how do you do music without thinking of waves and acoustics constantly? <laughs> no, I, uh, no, I don't um, think very constantly about this, but um, I 
yeah, it's clearly, I mean, there are some things like in, in, in harmony, if you have some mathematical background that, that, that helps, you know, in understanding harmony and the, and the weird laws that, that people have developed over the centuries <laughs> to, to make sound, uh, well, music sound better or, or worse, uh, depending what their aim was. Um, I can tell you uh, something quite, quite funny, since you were we did talk about classical mechanics before. I, as I said, I, I, I sail uh, since always, uh, and at some point I was uh, doing a, uh, you know, it was not really course, but we were in a place with, with a guy who was very experienced, uh, and it was, uh, and we were doing outing in a place where there was a lot of wind and, and nice boats. So, uh, at some point, and then we were discussing a lot with this guy about, and then uh, at the end of the course, he, he told me, well, but when you discuss about sailing, you don't look at uh, a boat or the wind, but you have, in your mind, you have vectors. <laughs> you have vectors that move, that uh, sum up, the, and, and so on, they subtract, and then this is what, what, what you think of when you, when you think of sailing. Yes. <laughs> so not the music, but the sailing, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah, a great everything, story. right? I mean, physics is everywhere. <laughs> So one last question that's also not really physics related. Um, yes. Imagine that you're leaving the planet and you can just choose to remember one book. And what book would oh I god. take with you or remember um, by heart? <laughs> okay, my god, that, that's a very tricky question, of course, because there are many books you would like to, of course, to take, remember, and so on. Is uh, it the book you just edited? <laughs> You've just recently edited a book yeah, about classical mechanics. Written. No, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. But it was mainly the students who actually wrote it. Mm. So it was a really great experience because they really they were enthusiastic. They really mm. liked that and great. Uh, I hope they will be actually used next year. Mm. It should be used next year. Uh, anyway, uh, now there is a maybe a book that I read when I was at university, uh, which is actually hard to remember because it's enormous, uh, and it's called uh, le Scherbach by Douglas Verstatter. It's a very nice book because it it has parallels between art, music, and science, of course, things about, a lot about how the brain works, about complex systems and things like that. And uh, it's actually a, a book that I enjoyed very much, and I still remember it with a lot of pleasure, so I would, I would advise all the, you know, students your age, right. because that's, yeah, it's yeah. nice reading. It <laughs> takes time okay. and <laughs> takes effort, but it's worth every it's single worth. page. Well, thanks for this recommendation, and thank yes. you for this interview <laughs> at CERN. Thank all right. you. Thank you. <laughs>